Hello and welcome to week six in the graphics class and we have been having a wonderful time with those of you who have been uh, participating and I hope that more of you will continue to participate because it's rather important and especially since uh, like some courses in the sciences, not so much in this uh, communication department, but in the sciences, these things build on each other. So you want to catch up if you aren't already. And it's kind of important uh, because a lot of these concepts are going to be really useful in the, uh, in the work that you're going to be doing in the near future, uh, particularly with regard to the major assignments, which you should be thinking about now. Uh, I'm not the least of which would be the, uh, the objects assignments. Uh, think about an object that you want to create in a context. Remember, print, 3D print, uh, TV logo, virtual reality, and multimedia. It's five possibilities. And uh, we'll talk, definitely we're in the position that we can talk about at least two of those now. Actually, three. And so we will be uh, talking about that uh, this week and the coming weeks. Uh, but what I wanted to introduce today was something we, we probably should have brought in a little earlier. Uh, because it is uh, very instrumental in all of this, and that's text. How to use text to make a logo, and also a little bit more detail on how to use the camera tool and layout. So that's what we're going to do in this little section. Okay, so logos, text, and the camera, or text, logos, and the camera, whatever you want to say. So to start with, uh, what is text? And uh, it's important that we understand this because text can mean just about anything. Uh, it's a very basic tool of graphics programs. It's been around forever. In fact, originally, if you had a graphics program, chances are all it really did was text. Uh, I can remember, uh, kind of a side note, uh, we used to have this thing called the Chiron a long, long time ago. Well, the character generator it used to be called. And it was this ugly gray box that you plugged into the, uh, the video system. And it would allow you to type words that would show up on the television. And usually, you had two fonts, which meant big and small. They're all uppercase. So really, there wasn't a whole lot you could do with it. And it was uh, uh, very ugly. And then from there, we eventually got to the point where we could choose the font, which used to cost a lot of money. Now it's basically everywhere. So you have the ability to choose all kinds of uh, styles of text, and really that's where we come to the present day because that's what this program will allow you to do. And it's not as easy as it seems. And before we get into exactly why, let's talk about what text itself is, which used to be a different thing. Text itself uh, is something called Unicode. It used to be called ASCII, but Unicode is a, uh, a more modern version of it. And the reason why that's important to understand is that Unicode will allow you to uh, use more than one alphabet. Uh, in America, obviously, we use the, uh, the English alphabet, you know, the 26 letters and uh, the nine uh, numeric characters and the punctuation. Uh, but there's also the Cyrillic alph alphabet that's used in, in Russia and, and Greece. Uh, and there are others as well. Unicode allows you to do that on the computer, which means to say that, uh, like hypothetically, let's say that you were working, uh, say, 40 years ago, and you had a character generator. If it had a keyboard at all, it was an English keyboard if, it, if you were using it in the United States. And if you wanted to put up foreign characters, good luck. There was no way to do it. Uh, these days, today, if you're learning Russian, for example, or even German, if you want to use the sharpest S or something like that, an umlaut over a letter, uh, that's usually a big, it used to be a big deal. Now it's, it's very easy, actually. And so text is very fluid. You know, it's, it's not based on the font, uh, but the audience sees the font. The font is something different. The text is what you type on the keyboard, and uh, once, once uh, you go beyond that, uh, you can decide what it looks like. Now, when you say font, really you're changing the typeface, and that's what we're going to talk about next. Now, the font, uh, when we say font or typeface, first of all, it's, it's the shape of the letters, uh, meaning that you, you can have a capital A or a lowercase a, and you can see so many thousands of, of variations on that, uh, but that would, it's, it's still the same letter. And so the font is the way the letter actually looks uh, when you see it in a document or online or something like that. 
And there are millions of fonts, more all the time, more than we could possibly ever need. Now they fall into four basic font families, which we do have to mention uh, because it's rather important. Uh, the first is what's called Gothic or sans serif. Now that means this is a font which does not have a serif on it. And I'll give you a demonstration of that when we get into the program. But a serif is kind of like a foot that appears on, the, uh, on some of the letters. You'll notice here uh, the word font. There's that little foot there. That is a serif. A serif is a, um, is a well, it is a serif. It, it's described uh, only as a foot or something like that. And if it has a serif, then it is, or if it does not have a serif, it's a Gothic font. If it does have a serif, it's a Roman font. Roman fonts have serifs, Gothic fonts don't. Simply put, that's what it is. And so you can take all of the fonts made and usually you can divide them in half between Roman and Gothic. And so uh, and you can choose which one you want to work with, but you can say, well, that's a Roman font, that's a Gothic font. Now, a third font is a script font where that tries to simulate handwriting. And sometimes that can be useful. I wouldn't recommend you overuse it because it's that much harder to read. And finally, we have what's called a novelty font. Those are your dingbats and things like that, little icons, emojis. And I would strongly suggest that you avoid using those at all costs uh, because they are usually extremely annoying and they don't accomplish much. And so if you're going to use a novelty font, have a very good reason for it and use it very sparingly, if, you, if at all. Now, the problem uh, in this particular class and this concept with the fonts is that fonts are based on 2D shapes. So if you're designing a font, you're literally creating a two-dimensional shape that will represent a letter, and that will, will then be uh, responding to the, the ASCII or the Unicode text that the keyboard generates. But usually this is two-dimensional. The moment you apply three dimensions to this, you have to extrude it. So you got to take it as a two-dimensional shape and pull it out. And that can be a good thing. That can work very easily. But every once in a while, you've got a font that doesn't like to be extruded. And that's because you're trying to create uh, this uh, three-dimensional uh, letter out of a two-dimensional face. And it could be that there's something about that that creates impossible geometry. And this happens a lot. Uh, so some fonts are hard to use because they generate impossible geometry. And the logo tool, which I'm going to demonstrate, is the most reliable way to do this. But even then, uh, there's always a possibility of impossible geometry. And so you can, you can fix this sometimes. Sometimes you have to sort of work around it. Or sometimes you have to choose a different font. You know, even if the client wants this particular font, you guys say, look, I can't work with this one. So that's going to be something that you may have to deal with. Now, logos, uh, a logo is not just words. A logo is something uh, that really expresses an idea. If a company has a logo, it could be they've already got it, and really all you're doing is making it three-dimensional. And so you don't want to change a company logo without the company asking you to. Uh, sometimes you're just going to work with the thing and see what you can do with it. And you can work with it in, in, the, in the 2D version and make a 3D version of it sometimes by tracing it and doing other methods, uh, which I will put up tutorials that show you how to do that. Uh, but if you're making your own logo, you could start with, with your name or with the name of your company, choose a font that you like, and then maybe modify it a little bit. So you can make it bigger or make some letters bigger than others, put a slant in it or other, manu or other modifications. And you can in incorporate 3D graphics with text. For example, let's say there's an I in the logo, and it's a sports company, and so you turn the little dot in the I into a basketball or something like that. Uh, there's all kinds of ways that you can do that, and that is really what you want to do. You also want to really think about surfaces. You want to think what you can do with surfaces. Have reflections within reflections, for example, uh, things like that. And basically, that leads to magic. Once you get into animation, you can animate this stuff. You can make it do wonderful things. And so it's your logo. You want to think about that. Or maybe it's a client's logo. Maybe you want to make some money. But that's where we're coming from. And also, you're going to want to work with the camera tool and work with positioning, uh, which we're going to get into during the demonstration. 
This is very important for getting your point across. The uh, Modeler program. And Modeler, if you look over in the Create mode, it has a text tool. And we're not going to bother with that at this point. It does have its issues. I'm, I'm just going to start with a logo tool because it's really the easiest one for a logo design. So uh, generally, you're not going to want to do a lot of body text in this program or really in any 3D graphics program. That should be normal text. Leave that for the, um, for the print version. You know, so if you, in other words, if you're doing a logo, do that as the letterhead. Let the print just be regular print. I would recommend doing that. If you go to logo, you get this dialog box here, and it allows you to establish everything you need to do here all at once so that you don't have to worry about that. So I'm going to type in a word. Now, the word could be anything. So let's say that my company is called Bentley. I have no idea who that is, but we'll just do it anyway. It's going to automatically try to extrude that. And here is where it gets interesting. You have an enormous amount of possible uh, fonts that you can use. Now, before you do that, you might want to have an idea what they are in the first place. Now, let me show you a real trick. So I'm going to leave this alone for a minute. If you go to your word processor, you know, this is just your regular word processing program. So let's say, uh, let's say I, well, first of all, let's, let's just look at this real quick. If I make this big enough so you can see, uh, that is a serif, the, the word serif right now. It happens to be an oxymoron because it has no serif. So if I'm over here, and this is just in Microsoft Word, let's say I put that in Times New Roman, now it does have serifs. And so that's an example of a font. I could also use, uh, for example, Arial, you know, which is a, a, a sans serif font. Or I could go with something like, uh, like this which is a script font. Please don't use that. It looks awful and it will create impossible geometry. That much I can guarantee you. And so the reason I'm bringing this up is because you can look over here and actually see in programs like this, the font that you'll be choosing. And so, you know, something like that, I'd be tempted to use that, but I, I wouldn't really want to because it would probably go nuts. So what about this one, Forte? Forte doesn't look that bad. It might possibly work. I can see some areas that may double up on themselves, uh, but I'm going to give that one a shot. So I'm back over here. And so I'm going to find Forte here in the list. And Forte 400. And so I'm going to take a chance and I hit OK. And look what happens. So if you look at it over here, and let me just move myself out of the way here. So if we can see, we got Bentley. And if I go in on that, if I were to then look at this, I can see that it actually worked. This is in the Forte font. I am not seeing holes in the font. If there were holes, then I would say that that was, a, that was a lost cause. It wouldn't work. So it actually did it. And so I've got the font. Now, before we leave it, on the other hand, that doesn't mean we have to deal with it as is. Now, in this case, we're looking towards the front to the back, and it looks backwards. And that concerns me a little bit because, uh, just to be frank with you, this program does not always like um, text. It's not the very best text editor I've ever used. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it over into here, into layout. So if I go here, and well, actually, before I do that, I've got to first save it. So I'm going to save this. And so I'm going to call this Bentley, whoever Bentley is. And then I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to load that, file load object. And there's Bentley. I'm going to load the object, and it's looking fine here. And what I was concerned about was that it might look backwards. And if we're looking at it from the front, it could be somehow we're, we're seeing it the wrong way. It's, it's showing up backwards here, but it's not showing up backwards here. And if we go to our perspective view, we can see that the camera is looking at it head on. There's nothing wrong with it. Now, if this were a problem, all I would have to do is change this to back 
and it's going to look correct. And actually, that's where it should have been in the first place, so it's probably left over for something I did before. Now, before we leave this, uh, let me tell you that it's possible to do all kinds of things with it. So, for example, let's say that I put myself in point mode where I already am, and let's say I grab the B in Bentley, and I can release those two points there, and I could modify that in any number of different ways. So, for example, if I were to go to, uh, to stretch, I could give that a little bit of a different shape. And then if I were to move that, so that would be a very simple modification. Or it could be, and this is something even simpler than that. Let's say I want to just take the whole thing and uh, rotate it. So let's, let's say for some reason I want to do that. So Bentley on, on a rotation. And of course, you can literally do anything else. You can grab any of those points and move those any which way you want. And that could be how you are customizing this. Now, the other thing we're going to want to do is allow us to, um, to edit this in multiple ways. And so I'm going to go into polygon mode. And I'm going to grab that first layer here, the very front of the, uh, of the words. And I'm going to change its surface. And I'm going to call that face face. And that's all I'm going to bother with because I really don't need any other uh, points. I can just use the rest of the object, the default surface, for anything that I want. So I'm going to go ahead and save it that way. Then if I'm looking at it here, you notice how it changed. Now it has that, uh, that different look to it. And of course, you can, you can continue to modify that if you want to. Uh, but I'm going to be relatively happy with that at this point. Now, if I go into camera view, let's see what I get. Camera view is seeing it head on. I want to get a little closer to it. So I'm going to light up camera there. And you can see that if you go to modify, modify move is already set up. I'm going to go in a little bit closer to that. And let's see what I've got to work with. I can see there's a little bit of problem there. So I'm going to go into the surface editor. And I'm going to, on my default surface, I'm going to hit smoothing. See what smoothing does? It takes away the suggestion of the geometry there that we don't want to see. I don't really need to put smoothing on the, um, on the face. Uh, we could, but we just don't have to. So let's, uh, let's leave that one alone. But what I could do is I could go to my, uh, my virtual progressive render, and I can see that we have uh, basically a, a very blank, plasticky looking uh, logo here. So let's decide what our colors are going to be. I could make Bentley be kind of a, uh, a blue color. I could make it glow if I want to. Or I could give it some other kind of a texture. I could give it, I could turn down the luminosity. I'm going to keep this relatively simple because we've gone over this before. I could add some specularity and uh, put in some, make, give it a glossy look to it if that comes up. I could even give it partial transparency if I want to. Or I could apply some kind of a surface to that, which in this case, I'm going to suggest that we not do. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm just going to go with a little bit of luminosity so the letters glow a little bit. I'm going to do all the rest with the default surface. So with the default surface, I'm going to stick with a cool color, kind of like a darker blue there. And the default surface, I'm going to add a little bit of luminosity, but I'm also going to up the transparency. And I'm going to give that a double-sided situation so that I can make it transparent and have it reflect. So. There we got, we got kind of like this weird thing going on. So what we don't want it to do, we don't want it to detract from the main words. We don't want to make it hard to read. 
but we want to give it the, uh, the illusion that something is going on in there. I can even put in a refraction index that can, that can do some interesting stuff. And so again, you could take this as far as you want, uh, and there is your logo, something along those lines. Now, what I wanted to show you next is a way to go even further without a really adjusting the model at all. And so what I want to show you is if you go into the camera, if you're in the camera mode, if you go to properties, we've looked at this before, this is where you can set your resolution. But you can also look at the lens. Now, right now, the lens is a 24 millimeter lens, which in most circles is going to be what you would think of as a normal lens now, kind of normal to wide angle. What would happen if I were to change this and take it back? Now notice that we're, we're zooming out. I can zoom out from this, but then if I were to move the camera in, do you see the difference? The lens is distorting the words. In fact, I could even go further. I could zoom out yet more. Take this down to real fisheye material. And after a certain point, it just gets ridiculous. And then if I begin to bring it in, can you see what's going on now? And so just by changing the lens, by changing the focal length, I can create a completely different effect. And so if you go here, you can see you have a zoom factor. If you don't like working with focal length, you can go with that. Uh, and uh, let's not go into that necessarily, but you, don't, you also have the ability to choose your camera. If you happen to know anything about that, uh, you can choose a specific camera or you can just work on the focal length and, and see what, you, what you've got. You can make a new camera, uh, things like that. Uh, let's just stick with this right now because it's, it's nice and easy. So that's a potential logo. Now I noticed that when we did this, we, we just brightened this up a little bit too much. So I'm gonna go into my surface editor, go to my default surface, turn that luminosity down just a little bit. In fact, if you take it down a little bit more, then you get the suggestion of what's going on, this energy, so to speak. But it doesn't so much, not so much that it, uh, it makes it distracting. Then what I wanna do is I wanna go over here again. I think we're done with this now. And I wanna change my resolution. I, wanna, I want this for print. So I'm gonna take that up to 2000. And I want to take this up to, uh, let's say, 1,000. And that may be enough. Let's say we, we give it that much resolution. Because if you're going for print, hypothetically, you want that kind of resolution. And so then I can move the camera in that much more, and I can fill that in there. Now, if you go too far, you actually go into it. Wow, that's weird. Yeah, that could be useful. And I remember that one. But if you go into it, you can see, you go into the reflections. But here we got something we can use. So that's the logo. Let me show you what you would do with it next. Uh, you would just like normal. You would hit your function F9, and do your, your your function key, and it's going to take a while to generate that. Now I haven't created any kind of a background for it because we don't necessarily need one. But it's going to do all of that. And it's going to take a few minutes. And even with a, a lot of processing power, these things can sometimes take a while to do their thing. Uh, and so uh, just so you know, if you're doing multiple animation, it would, it would do this for every 30th of a second. So you could literally be waiting for days uh, to get an animation completed. Uh, but that's actually part of the, uh, the beauty of this, because you can just set it going and then do everything else that you had in mind to do and then come back and get the finished product. But here it's almost done, and we'll see what it generates. And so this will be uh, really a 4K style image in terms of the resolution. It will be better than high definition. And there it is.
So we're going to continue this. Now here, I'm going to take this image and I'm going to um, save RGB. I'm going to go to PNG32 because I want the alpha channel. And I'm going to put that into here and I'm going to call this Bentley. And I haven't really saved the scene because there is no scene. It's just the object. Now I should save the scene if I want to go back to this because remember, I've got, uh, I've got a camera that I've, I've, just, I've adjusted to do this. But um, that's basically it. Now, I'm going to take this into a different context. I'm going to go to Photoshop. So if I open this in Photoshop, this is what I get. You can see where the transparency is going to be. Now, where could you use something like this? Well, let's say that we want to do that as a bug. Uh, that's literally what they call that for some kind of a video. And so if we were to look for an image, so I just happen to have this image here of the Statue of Liberty. Let's say I want to put that into there somehow. So if I select all and I do an, a copy and I do an edit paste, we'll see that we've got this. And so that can be our logo and we can put it anywhere we want within the image. And it, because it's got that transparency, it will blend in. And chances are we'd want to make it smaller, uh, but that's, that's how you would use a logo. We can also put this in the context of a print program if we wanted to make a letterhead. So if we were going to do that, we would use a program called InDesign. And InDesign is uh, Adobe's program that is used specifically for working with paper. And so if we're going to do that, if I make a new project in InDesign, and here, I'm just going to use the default settings. If I hit Create, you'll see that InDesign uses this. Now, this is your standard sheet of paper, and we'll have our own special lecture for just this part. And I'm going to set the rulers to read it in inches, and over here in inches as well. If you right-hand click, you can get those points. You'll notice that the paper starts from 0, goes to 8.5, and, and it goes down to 11 inches that is a standard piece of paper. So if I'm making letterhead, I just want to put that up on the top there. And so if I were to go to File, Place, and I go here and I place that image, there it is. I can just drop that anywhere I want. Oops, it comes out looking real big. And so what I'd have to do in this context is kind of simmer it down a bit. which isn't that hard to do. And sometimes the program adds more resolution than you really need. So if that's my letterhead, and I will just uh, back this off a little bit so I can get the frame of it within, within control. So there is my letterhead. It's kind of exaggerated. And what I would probably do is I would, oops, back that off again. What I'd probably do is I would move that up to the top of the page. And it could be that that's all it is. Maybe I have my street address over here and that becomes letterhead. And then basically I export that as a PDF and uh, I print off a thousand pages. And so then that's what I write my business letters on, assuming that we're still writing business letters on paper. Or that can be the beginning of a postcard or something along those lines. And that is how you would do that. So uh, this is just a taste of what you might want to think about doing in making objects uh, in 3D graphics uh, that can be used in print and for other tools.